Okay, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, so if you're ready to uh, begin, our first question, which has been compiled by our Yale photo students, is what is your most vivid memory from childhood? Oh, wow. Going deep right from the start, Gregory. It's just gonna get deeper from the <laughs> Okay, um, my deepest memory from childhood, most vivid memory. You know, I think, um, I don't know that this is the earliest memory, but it's the most vivid. It, uh, I moved around a lot as a kid. We, we moved constantly. And uh, I think because of that, I had a sort of um, fragmented childhood. And, and from house to house, there was nothing coherent. It was hard to know what you could take root into. But I, you know, I asked my dad if every time we moved, if we could at least move into neighborhoods with climbing trees or if there could be climbing trees nearby. Um, and he really was good on that promise. And so I think my most vivid early memories are of those trees. Like I remember very specific trees in each town or each city that uh, I would crawl up into the top of. And I don't know, I think I had this sense when I was very young that everything felt very impermanent, but that the trees were more permanent and that they were a kind of access to the ether, but they were also deeply rooted in the ground. Um, so I think something about the saw, like the solidity of those branches and feeling held in those spaces when, when the rest of my childhood felt a little, a bit chaotic and disjointed um, was very meaningful to me. So lots of, lots of vivid things of, of very specific trees that I still love. That's a great answer. Who were your early influences when you were coming of age as an artist? Wow. Um, you know, I came, I came to art so late. Um, Tell us about that, actually that journey for you. I, I studied, um, I studied economics in school, uh, in college. Part of that, I went to a really big public high school, uh, you know, 4,000 kids. I was just trying to find a way to take enough AP classes to like get good grades and, you know, get into a university. Um, and it wasn't really until I got to Georgetown that I think because I was an, I declared myself an economics major, I finally gave myself permission to, explore the, the art inside. Um, and so I started taking a lot of photography classes at Georgetown um, as all, all my electives. And then eventually that became my dual major. And, and I think it was really through, you know, so through that there started to be this burgeoning film movement on campus. I think because my generation went to school right when the first sort of prosumer digital cameras were coming out and you could get a laptop with Final Cut Pro and you could, get this software from the digital arts department. And so we all started making these uh, small films. And I saw a small, a short film that my, my best friend, uh, Zalbot Monglidge and uh, Mike Cahill, two other students at Georgetown, I saw a short film they made and I was blown away. And we all started making stuff together. And it was actually Zal who introduced me. Uh, we were gonna make a film together called Bernadette. And he was like, before we watch this, you need to watch these other films as references. And I had never seen movies like this before. Like I came from a pretty sheltered, you know, childhood where I just kind of watched tentpole movies. But Zoll's list of films for me included uh, Red by Krzysztof Kozlowski. I don't know if you've seen this film, I'm sure, yeah. And uh, Double Life of Veronique. And I watched these films and I was blown away. I mean, I can still remember the visceral feeling I had watching Irene Jacob on screen. Oh, it felt to me like she was something beyond even an actor. She was like a, like a mystic who was just channeling something through her and, and the cinematographer and the score and, you know, the director, they were all there together creating this humming alive thing that felt, um, I don't know, Kislowski feels to me like he can touch on something metaphysical that many of us feel about being alive but collapses the moment you try to articulate it in language it's almost like 
language is too heavy. It's this like thing that kind of weights it down, um, unless you happen to be a fantastic poet. Um, but those early movies, Red, Double Life of Veronique Blue, when I saw those, I was like, oh, I didn't know that the image could do this, that the moving image could do this, that you could point to these feelings that are so hard to um, decipher or, or tell each other about otherwise. This um, kind of anticipates the next question. Um, what is the movie that changed your life? Oh, wow. Those films or are there others? Well, those, but... You know, I think the one that really, um, I, I watched it around that time. I think the one, the, the thing that made me feel like, oh, maybe I could be a filmmaker, maybe I could be a storyteller. I felt that very much when I watched uh, Chris Marker's short film, La Jete. I don't know how many of you have seen that. If you can give a thumbs up if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it's an amazing work. And I think because my background at school was photography, you know, still black and white images. When I saw La Jete, it was the first time I thought, oh, I could, you know, that's something I could do. Like I take still images and you can string these still images together and you can tell a story and each still image on its own tells a story. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, La Jete is this amazing black and white film. Uh, uses voiceover narration and tells this incredible science fiction story about time travel. Um, the movie 12 Monkeys is, you know, would come later and be inspired by that short film. Um, but I, I was blown away by how much he could do with so little. It's like, there's almost no budget there, you know? It was just about who he cast and the, the voiceover he used and the editing of these images and somehow he created something of greater spectacle and awe and delight than you know huge movies with you know 120 million dollar budgets and here's this person making something handmade and uh small but oh my god to me it contained the whole world in it uh the next question is would you consider your work to be autobiographical Wow, Gregory, these questions are off the hook. Um, what would I consider my work to be about? I mean, I think this about it. I think um, maybe because I moved around so much as a kid, I got this sense very early on that identity is a kind of performance. Mm. I noticed that when I moved from one town to the next, that I was sort of cherry picking the evidence of who I am and presenting a new facet of myself because I knew that that facet would be able to make friends and find community better in this place. And, and I didn't ever consider it deceitful. I don't think it is deceitful. I think it's a kind of like, uh, if you imagine yourself as like a dodecahedron of many faces, you know, you're kind of just turning a new angle of yourself to catch the sun each time. And so I think I emerged from that childhood thinking very much that identity is a kind of thing you play with. Um, and so I guess in that sense, um, in the roles that I've written or the roles I've played or the stories I've told, I think I, you do sometimes feel a, a calling to play them or to do them. And I think that that might be about visiting the facets of yourself that don't get the sun very often. You know, they're the sides of yourself that you throw into the shade, you know, maybe because they make you uncomfortable or you're afraid of what might come out if you expose them. Um, and so I think sometimes characters or certain situations will come from that dark side of the moon, so to speak, and you, you put it forward to see what comes out. You know, I think, um, I remember when Zal and I had made Sound of My Voice, uh, an early film that we made on a shoestring budget that went to Sundance, and uh, we showed it to our best friend, Mike Cahill, and Mike Cahill kind of looked at me after the film, and you know, we'd been living together for years at this point, and Mike was like, whoa, I didn't know you had that capacity for cruelty within you, you know, because Maggie in Sound of My Voice is incredibly cruel and sort of insightful but vicious, ferocious character. 
Um, but I think I do have that. That is one of my sides. It's just a side that I keep, you know, in the rear view mirror more often than not. And so I think there is something somewhat autobiographical about drawing out repressed personas within you and seeing what's inside them and doing it in front of other people, which can always be somewhat humiliating, <laughs> depending on how it goes. What is, the, what is the least favorite part of the artistic process for you? The least favorite? Wow. You know, I think to me, it's, um, I think it's, to me, it's the confusion of the part of art that meets commerce and specifically late capitalism, which creates this, this um, feeling of kind of cannibalizing everything and, and turning everything into a sale. And I think that that can slowly eat away at you. And I, I feel I'm always trying to draw myself back to the feeling I had when I was the age of many of your students who are here. And I think when I was making work in college and just out of college, it was all coming instinctually. It, it came from a place of, oh, I feel I must do this. And, and you did it with a kind of revelry and, and joy, really embodied joy. Not so much fear of failure or critique or you know, any of that confusion. Um, and I think later, when you begin to make your living as an artist, and it's how you're paying your rent, which is an incredibly fortunate position to be in, and you have to take that so seriously and make sure you are every day telling stories that are worthwhile, I think. But I, I think that the nature of that can kind of, um, it can get at you. And you have to constantly, I think, I feel, keep, I'm constantly trying to keep that part of it at bay. Um, to not let the marketplace or the idea of, you know, this sort of abstract marketplace dictate what I feel I must tell next and instead get to that really quiet, you know, core original place that, um, that work can come from when you're not judging yourself. Does that, does that make right sense? Yeah. And the, how about the reverse? What is the part that you like the best? Oh God, so many parts. I love the surprises. I love the surprises. You know, when um, when Zal and I, Zal Batmanglaj and I were conceiving the OA together, we were really interested in this idea of movement, mm -hmm. um, just embodied movement as a kind of technology, technology that's more feminine, that's of the body rather than, you know, ones and zeros and, you know, keyboards and, you know, uh, and we, uh, Ryan Heffington, who's an amazing choreographer, designed these series of movements. And we all practiced them, the actors, and we learned them. And they were very difficult, surprisingly difficult, uh, deceptively challenging. Um, but I remember that first day that uh, Emery Cohen and I performed the movements on set. Mm. And we came to set and we were both so humiliated. And we were really scared to do these movements on set. Like nobody had ever seen anything like this before. We were telling this intense story. When you do them, you're doing them in front of an entire crew. You know, we didn't know what people were gonna make of them. Cause when people, were, you know, when the crew is signing on they're just reading a script. And, and that part you can't, you know, until it becomes visual, it's hard to understand what it means when the script says, and now they do the movements, you know, all. <laughs> Fuck, you know, underscore. Um, and Emery and I showed up that day and something happened, like just ego and vanity and fear, everything fell away. And we just looked at each other and we just let this language come out of us. And it was so exhilarating. I have never, what a surprise. I had no idea that you can communicate with another human being through body language so much more intimately than you can through the spoken word. I had always relied on, you know, dialogue my whole life. And when the dialogue fell away, it was like whatever was passing between Emery and I was like the hot-blooded fire of a comet. I mean, I have never, 
I'm, it's rare to be that touched by another human being in your life. And I think that is the thing that I'm always chasing, that, that feeling of that great surprise that can come out of making art. Like you didn't know that was gonna be the place and then it's just there and you're like, for a moment, you really feel time stop and you are not in, you know, capitalist, you know, counting time anymore. You are in mythic time. Like you don't know where it begins. You don't know where it ends. You don't even know if you have a body, you know. Um, yeah, it is. I think it's a bit, it's a, some sort of high. I don't know. Have you ever experienced that Gregory when you're making your work? Just this like. Absolutely. I, you know, um, that's the moment we all live for when everything sort of clarifies itself and time stops. Yeah. That, the still photograph, that's what you hope for. Yeah. So tell us about the collaborative process, particularly with your partner, Zhao, and how that works. Um, you know, I think that uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, you know, you, you meet up with people early on and for whatever reason, your unique collection of experiences of being alive really trigger something in each other. I mean, I think Zal and I have this kind of like flint that we keep striking against each other and sparks keep coming up, you know? And I think every time we get done making something, we think like, oh, you know, will we do something again together? But then, you know, we just keep talking and a spark flies and it little, catches a little Kindle and it starts going. And, um, and I think it's because um, our, our minds work in some way or our emotions work in some way where we invite the other out. You know, if I, sometimes on I've talked about with something like the OA, which is uh, pretty different. Um, I think if either one of us had been making it on our own, we might have second guessed ourselves more or we might have um, caved to the pressure to make it more like other things. But because we had each other in it, you can kind of create this cocoon and all you need is for the other person to get it. And then you're kind of caught and then you have the courage to be like, okay, let's make this thing and put it out in the world. Um, so I think we've been able to do a lot that way. And I think that will probably also tell a lot of stories. You know, I think Zal has stories in him that are very specifically his own that he needs to tell. And I think I have the same. Um, and those will also come out over time and collaborations with other people. Um, but it is an extraordinary thing to meet up with somebody who you can, you can take a Venn diagram of your minds and you have some shared space in the center that's very fertile and keeps bearing fruit, you know? Like, I, I, I feel really fortunate for that. So taken as a whole, when you look at all the work you've produced, what do you see as the central themes and preoccupation of, of, your, of your work? Like the, mm. the lasting sort of um, identifiable obsessions and, um, um, and motifs. Wow. Um, you know, someone said to me once, and I, and I do think this is a theme that's there, is that a, a lot of it's very obsessed with um, insider, outsider, mm. um, what it means to be inside something or out versus outside something. Uh, in, in another earth, for example, um, Rhoda is an outsider, you know, she, she commits a crime accidentally and she's sort of was very inside society and then is thrust very far outside it. And she sort of meets another exile and together they heal each other. Um, the sound of my voice, you could say a sort of similar thing, you know, Maggie is sort of an exile in the basement, you know, she claims to be a time traveler and she's gathered this group and they've created their, their own inside and Peter and Lorna are you know, outsiders, but they're us, the audience, and they're trying to, you know, penetrate into this uh, world. And so I think that that's true. I think there's a, a preoccupation with that. I think it may also be, I mean, and this is just talking all the top of my head, 
Good. Because I, I think it's hard to know what you're after ultimately, because maybe if you knew it, you could stop. Yes. So I think I don't fully know, but I, I get the sense that it has to do with, okay, this might sound a little far out, but do you ever feel an awareness of yourself as like in a container? Like I sometimes feel like, like if there are, you know, people, if there are people in the sky, just like throwing souls into these containers and sending them to earth or however it works, you know, sometimes I feel like it's kind of like a Folgers coffee tin and that like the lid of my container just isn't completely sealed. And so I have the sense that I'm like, in this body, but that I'm also a little bit outside of it. Like I'm leaking out of my own body. And um, whatever that thing is, speaking of inside, outside, I can sometimes taste a connection with uh, something outside myself, whatever that is. Like, um, I think it's the place that, you know, when, when a lot of people invent something at the same time or, um, a lot of people are telling stories all over the world, making films, and they're hitting on similar themes and they all crop up at once. Like whatever that collective um, etheric realm is, I think I sometimes get a sense of that. And I'm preoccupied with telling stories that allow you to break out of the um, straight jacket that, modern life kind of binds you in you know like how can you shake free of that thing and and get back to that other sense of yourself um is that too far out gregory does that perfect you about that yeah <laughs> who's, who's your imagined audience imagined audience yes when you think about when you're producing a film or a body of work who do you think of in terms of like who's watching and um or do you ever imagine that it's like or do you think about that at all yeah i i see what you that what an interesting question that's so different from who is the audience who's yeah. your imagined audience is really a beautiful idea um you know i think a lot about my grandmother uh, she's dead, so I guess it's the audience of my grandmother's ghost. But I think I think about her because I found out only relatively recently um, her family was from Norway. They immigrated, they were, you know, goat herders, and they came to kind of like Scandinavian enclave in, the, uh, in Minnesota and didn't have much money and were farming. And um, she very much wanted to be an artist. Mm. I found out later in life, long after I'd moved to LA and been making stuff, that she, as a young woman, had come out to LA and had gotten into art school and was painting, was obsessed with painting the coastlines of, of uh, California, the edge of the continent. Um, and I've always been very mysteriously drawn to like Big Sur and that like rugged, that sense of the edge. Um, Anyway, I found out that, you know, she was painting and that was what she was obsessed with. And then her husband came back from war and she had to return to Minnesota and be a wife and a mother. And I think, you know, she was both happy to do that, but also angry, you know, and frustrated. And her canvas shrunk from being the canvas. She was these huge canvases of these seascapes and these things to being just the canvas of the family Christmas card every year, which was like, you know, three by five. Um, and I think a lot about that, about how so many women have had to give up their artistry or had, have had their art in them repressed to play these other roles that have been put upon them. Um, or even now, you know, women making art, you know, and it not being seen or acknowledged or the, the subject matter of feminine art not being seen as, as important or uh, intellectual or dynamic. Um, and I, so I guess I think about her a lot because I, 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 she makes me think that we're not as uh, individual as we think we are, that our, that our instincts and desires come from a kind of knowable unknowable lineage that we are acting out the deep feelings and wants of ancestors we may or may not have known and that you're it's all moving towards a kind of 
thing that wants to culminate and will not culminate with me. Or maybe I'll have a child and the child's child. So I think about her as an imagined audience often. I, I wonder, I imagine, you know, her, the ghost of her sitting in the back row of a cinema or, you know, watching Netflix. Isn't what an image a ghost watching Netflix. Um, and I wonder what she makes of these stories. And I wonder if she thinks they're worthwhile, you know, because I think about her sacrifice a lot. I think a lot about how, how many women have sacrificed so much so that some of us could now be in a position to get to speak. Um, yeah. How has, um, is, is there a work of art that has made you cry? Oh, so many, yeah. Um, okay, can I tell you one most recently? Yes, please, please. Because I, if I had to think of all of them, I don't even, um, I rewatched, um, I was in bed, I was, uh, had a surgery recently, and so I was bedridden for a period, and I rewatched almost all of Miyazaki's movies, and I, I watched Princess Mononoke again. How many people have seen Princess Mononoke? Anybody? Yes, yeah. Um, the scene where Lady Iboshi, uh, she comes and the, the forest spirit finally comes out at the end. You know, this entire story is about a woman who runs Iron Town and she's kind of become the sort of consummate capitalist. Um, but she's also protecting all these women and so she's, she's good and she's bad and she wants to slay this forest spirit to make more room for Iron Town. And finally at the end of the film, sorry, spoiler for those of you who hadn't, haven't seen it, but you should still watch it. She cuts off the head of the forest spirit and the forest just starts to disintegrate everywhere. Oh my word, every time that happens, I cry, I cry, 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 cry. Because I feel like Miyazaki really felt, you know, deeply the damage that we're doing to the planet and how urgent it is that we repair within ourselves in order to begin to repair what we've done to the uh, natural world. Um, so that makes me cry like nothing else. Will you tell me, Gregory, which, what makes you cry? A film you've seen that made you cry? Almost everything, including the, the five movements. Oh. Made, which I think I told you, actually. You did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, what doesn't make me cry is the question for me. <laughs> How has success affected your work, success? Wow. Um, I mean, wow. Uh, it's it's funny because I think there. I, I feel like there's sort of a dual thing coming up in me, which is there's the way the world defines success, mm -hmm. which you you cannot help that that is going to influence you because we are creatures of we connect with each other. So that, that has an impact on me. But then there's also how I define success more deeply inside me. And um, I would say that for me, I don't think I have done yet the thing that I want to do. Like, and maybe all artists feel the sense of you're chasing something. You want to close the gap between what you're capable of imagining and then what you actually articulate. And I think, you know, as your skill set develops and you practice and you try and you fail, you, um, you, you're able to have the gap, you know, sort of get closer and closer and closer, but it's never, it's never close enough, you know, you always want it, you always want it to be better than it is. And so maybe that kind of sweet insatiability um, urges you on. Um, and then I think the other aspect, which is the work being consumed by the world and maybe what the world thinks of it and whether they think you're successful or unsuccessful at what you do. I think that I have tried very much in my life to block it out because I worry that even more damaging than sort of just empty snarky criticism, of which there's always a lot for whatever reason, um, is, the, is praise. Um, I think that when people start to tell you who and what you are um, or what you do well, um, or I think that that can be really damaging because it starts to narrow your uh, 
field of vision, you know, you start to, narrative is so powerful, you start to believe it. Um, so I try a lot to try to keep that at bay. I try to never read reviews. Um, I, I try to keep it <laughs> as close as I can to myself. Of course, you always get a sense of it because you bump into somebody in the coffee shop and they'll be like, oh, I read that review. Well, that was a real takedown. You know, and you're like, no, no, please don't give it to me. And then they do give it a little anyway. Um, but, they, but you learn to throw your walls up. And I think that those walls are really important uh, because the truth is the older I get, and I wonder if you find this too, they have no idea. Nobody knows, like really nobody knows. I think as an artist, you have the best idea when you get quiet and you go deep of something that could be valuable to put on offer, you know? Um, when you're young, or at least when I was young, I kept thinking that somebody knew. But the older you get, you realize that there is no one there. There's no one at the center. The center of it doesn't hold. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Like there's actually no place to arrive. There's no stage to get on. There's no, like nothing is ever gonna um, hold. Uh, does that make sense? Or was that a ridiculous answer? <laughs> what have you learned through failure? Everything. Um, everything. Wow. I would say the last biggest one I learned um, uh, when the OA was canceled was the sense of um, having made something that was somewhat unsustainable in that it was so ambitious. It wanted to do so much. Um, and Zal and I were basically together making an eight hour film every two years on an indie budget, you know, and that is, I mean, that's insane. If anybody who on here who's ever made one indie film in two years, just making one indie film in two years is a lot. And we multiply that volume by four, you know, it was sort of a completely untenable thing ultimately. And um, so I think about that a lot. Like when something doesn't work, is not sustainable, you kind of have to take a moment and reflect and be like, why did we design it that way? Um, and I think about that also in terms of just the earth, you know, I think we burn ourselves out in this culture and that is also what we're doing to the planet, like literally sucking all the nutrients out of the soil and dumping chemicals on top of it. And, you know, we do a similar thing to our own bodies, I think, which is like um, you, you're, you have your foot in the door and you don't want to be kicked out and you want to keep making work. And so you can very easily find yourself in a situation where you're trying to do too much um, and not like nourishing yourself, not living in a sustainable way in the house of your body. And, um, and then the well can really run dry. So I think I, I really learned a lot from that reboot, even though it was really hard to not finish the story. But who knows, maybe we'll get to finish it in another, in a different form or you know, years down the road. Twin Peaks did come back, so you never know. Do it by Zoom. Yes, if you do Zoom, we could just pass out the script and we could all play the parts. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? Oh my goodness. You know what's so interesting about that question? I. Um, I was raised in a very like, you know, kind of like Lutheran, like puritanical home where all pleasure is guilty. So it's sort of like anything enjoyable is sort of you should be punished for because it's all about the kind of like, you know, work ethic. Work ethic. Um, so I guess in my life right now, I'm trying to think about pleasure uh, as not guilty. I'm trying to think about it as like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think about it as something I deserved, but in that sense, do you know, you know what I mean by that? Yes. Um, but I know what you mean by guilty pleasure. And I guess, you know, sometimes, I mean, I'm taking planes less now. Um, but when I have, when I do take them or when I have in the past, I love, to watch a rom-com. Rom-coms at like 35,000 feet play completely differently. I mean, they're really 
tear jerkers. Like you can just be watching Matt McConaughey and Kate Hudson, you know, do their thing on, what was the name of that movie? Uh, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Yeah. And you're just like sobbing, sobbing. And the, you know, the flight attendant's looking at you like, God, what is she watching? And then they come around the back of your screen and it's just like, you know, Matt McConaughey chasing Kate Hudson on a bridge, you know? But for some reason, those are a guilty pleasure of mine. I guess maybe because I've never done a romantic comedy before. So I feel when I'm watching them that I'm not working, like I'm not analyzing how they work. Like how, what is the scene construction? How is it building to the midpoint failure? How is it recovering? What are these cuts like? Like none of that, I'm just enjoying the fun. <laughs> It's been a common theme in all these talks. It's been crying in airplanes for some reason. It's been, that's a really interesting phenomenon. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's so easy to cry up there. I guess because, is it just the pressure or is it that you are, feel somewhat like close to your own death? You know, so you, you feel this like your mortality is like your seatmate with you. And so everything about the human experience is moving, even like, you know, a rom-com. So the last question, what advice would you give the students in this moment of peril? Oh, I hear the bird, I hear a bird. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. they've but come back in LA because the pollution's fallen away. There's huh. like an owl that I hear in this tree behind my house all the time now that's like, yeah, um, advice. Do you know the best piece of advice someone ever gave me was don't ever take advice from anyone. And he didn't mean that in a glib way. He meant it in like, he didn't mean, you know, for instance, like don't respect your elders or your elders don't have wisdom to give you because of course they do. I think he was saying, or how I interpreted it was, you have something inside you, some blueprint the same way that a seed for an oak tree contains within it the design of the oak. I mean, from the beginning, it's that blueprint is there and it just unfurls. And sometimes I find I'm able to tap into that in myself and then I know what comes next. And so I, I think that's what he meant about um, not listening, not taking anyone else's advice, but trying to get quiet and unfold. So from that perspective, I could tell you the thing I'm advising myself every day. Um, I wouldn't dare to advise it to anybody else, but for myself in this really strange time, I've been thinking about two things. I've been thinking a lot when I wake up about the idea of being a citizen in a democracy. Um, I watched this documentary Astra Taylor did recently called What is Democracy? And it was so inspiring. Uh, and it, it, I really felt this idea or this sense of like civic duty, like what, how can you, even though we've gotten so big and we're all on Zoom and we can't touch or hold each other and I can see Elsa here and I can see Rita and Zach is taking a sip of something right now and now he's looking to see if it was, but uh, they we're all here and yet we're not here, you know, Isabella, every, I, and that's hard. It's hard to hold on to our, our sense of, being of a, of a public, you know, and, but I've been thinking about that a lot. I've been waking up every day and trying to think of like, what in my community can I do today to alleviate the difficulty of this crisis for people who are in a much more compromised place than I am. Um, and sometimes that's active, you know, sometimes it's, I went with my partner the other day to a protest where everybody got in their cars and made homemade signs and put them on the windshields of the cars and we drove around the LA courthouse honking our horns and playing music, you know, asking for juveniles of nonviolent crimes to be released. Um, because of course, you know, being in prison without proper sanitary conditions and proper social distancing right now is really unsafe. And so that is a moment of like, oh, you can get out there and you can do something safe in public. But a lot of times, because we're in quarantine, it's a quieter thing. It's like, how can I find mutual aids on fun, uh, mutual aid funds online and like put money in places where it can really um, be used, you know, or what, what can I do to like, if you have the time to read and reflect, if you, if you are lucky enough to have that time, how can I educate myself about what 
what steps we really need to take next to like continue to have a thriving democratic forum or you know so there's that and then i think the other thing i think about a lot for myself in this time is what story must i tell next and that's really different from what story do i want to tell next or what would i like to tell next um there was an idea actually that that zal and i had worked on together for i mean i think we've been working on it for like over a decade and we just shelved it the other day because we were like this isn't the one we must tell next. And that's really hard to do because you're like, wow, this is, we put so much time and energy in this, like it's ready to be born. But given the circumstance we're in, it's like, I think artists um, have this incredible job to do, which is that we can talk about what is not yet, but what could be, you know? Tony, uh, Tony Cade Bombera said something really amazing once she said, I think she was talking about the writer, but I think it applies to all artists that your job is to make the revolution irresistible, to make it appealing, you know, that in every image you take or film you make or character you embody, how are you pointing to the world that you want to invite in? Um, and how are you saying no to the world that is so clearly broken and crumbling, you know, very evidently all around us right now? I mean, I think it's a, for me, I feel a tremendous sense of optimism about having to face where we actually are and then having to do the really hard work of collectively dreaming together a completely new way of being. And then, you know, using art and writing and poetry and images to like walk there together, if, if that makes sense. It's a beautiful answer. And thank you so much for your eloquent and insightful answers to all the questions. Are you uh, fueling up to um, answering a few questions from students? Oh, yes, definitely. Please. Yeah. The way I'd like to do this, there are 800 participants out there. We are um, going to um, ask just the, my students um, first. At first, um, uh, so are there any uh, Yale photo students that would like to ask a question? Um, and we'll um, allow you to, we'll, meet, we'll um, remove your mute from here. Um, so we, any questions? or we could open it up larger. Um, I, I, any, okay, so maybe we should, Tom, Tommy, did you have a question? Yes. Tommy Ka. Hi, Tommy. Can you, um, Lindsay or? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi. Um, hi. Uh, I just want to say, like, uh, when I first moved to New Haven uh, to attend the program, uh, I somehow saw another Earth, and it was just, there was a scene in Gourmet Heaven that just really, I don't know, made it feel, like, welcoming for me to be in the MFA program. Um, so I, my question, um, uh, well, thank you for that movie, and thank you for the OA. Um, I have... I have like one serious question and one just weird, but uh, how do you deal with rejection? Mm -hmm. um, I think with being a creative person, that's a lot that comes with the territory a lot. And um, uh, I guess by less serious questions, like have you ever had an encounter with a doppelganger? <laughs> <laughs> I love those questions. Um, the, the rejection piece is really tough. You know, the only really balm that I have found for it is keeping a core group of friends around you who you really can see each other's work. And even when it gets knocked down, which I mean, I've been rejected so many times. I mean, I think every part I ever auditioned for, I was, I was never called back. I never got the part. Um, and that's hard to stomach. But then 
you know, I would make a short film or do a small tape and I would share it with, you know, friends, really close friends. And they weren't bullshitting me. Like I could tell when I had done something that moved them. And I, and I feel like that was the thing that allowed me to keep going and keeping like, okay, even though I've gotten knocked down, I'm going to get up again because, you know, this person I trust is saying, you've got something within you that's, that's there, that's going to come out and you can give it, but you just have to keep practicing and keep trying. Um, so I think community like that is really important. And as far as doppelgangers go, I remember once being at the airport and being on that moving walkway and like sort of not really paying attention, like being on my phone and then looking up and seeing this woman from behind who, it wasn't that she, it was that she was moving like I move, whatever that means. You know, you don't think you know that about yourself until you see someone else like do a particular gesture and you're like, what? Uh, but then she got off the moving walkway and started walking back towards me towards her gate and the spell was broken because she was not my doppelganger, but I'm still looking, Tommy. So. Oh man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That. Any other Yale photo students? Okay, we're going to open it up. Um, and you raise your hand and we'll, we'll do them one at a time. Okay. How about Brian? Brian Santos. Oh, Greg. Oh, yeah? Sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. Um, I had a question, if I could. Okay, good, good. Thank you so much for being here with us, Britt. Uh, I really am a big fan and I appreciate you being here. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about um, like the relationship for you between performing in the work and uh, being a writer, being a producer, you like in an ongoing way are performing as a body within it. I'm wondering what that relationship is like for you. Oof, what a great question. Um, have you ever read a book called The Body Keeps the Score? No, but someone just referenced it yesterday in their critique. Oh, I think you would find it really interesting because it's, it's all about, um, the idea that embodiment uh, allows us quite literally to move through certain neurological things that we cannot move through any other way. Like no amount of talk therapy is going to process certain things, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think uh, movement and dance, when I was a lot younger, dance was sort of the way I did that. And, and certainly then later acting um, was a way to like, even when I'm writing, even in the best scenario when I'm writing, when you really sort of leave yourself and you are inside each character's body as your the dialogue's coming out and you can hear them literally, you're sort of saying it as them on the page. And that can be a very beautiful experience of being connected, but it's still sort of in the, for me, it's in the mind's eye, it's in deep imagination that's very pleasurable but i think still for me the ultimate um catharsis comes from doing it myself you know literally being on the ground you know broken sobbing or you know laughing from a place deep in your belly at something unexpected in a scene it something really does come through and then out of you um and it's exhilarating and it's also terrifying i mean i think i feel much more in control and much safer uh, as a showrunner or as a producer, you know, as a producer, you're kind of just like, here I am, here's the budget. What do I need to, what money can I move from here to get this thing to happen here? And it's, a, some of that is a more um, intellectually rigorous problem solving exercise. It's still all very creative, but the catharsis that acting brings is what intimidates me the most and therefore what I am the most drawn to. We have a question from Mickey. Thank you. Um, this is overall a kind of broad question, um, but I was just um, wondering uh, if there are any current trends happening or current movements, I guess, within um, cinema um, or television, um, and just film at large, um, maybe that excite you today? Mm -hmm. What a great question. Um, 
one thing that really interests me is uh, the move towards long form storytelling. Like, I think we're starting to get to a place where the idea of TV is falling away, um, which kind of was initially developed more as like a, a mold that you developed that was a successful mold. And then you keep sort of stamping out the cookies and the dough. Um, I think there's a new approach now that feels more like novelized where you're taking your time with characters in a world and, and each hour is different and it's trying to get to something um, more like the novel does than a, I think film is like a poem and, and there is something to be said for this new long form that's more of a novelized approach that can get to different sort of, um, a far flung cast of characters, a, a more original world, like, and you can spend time in that space. So that really excites me. I think the other thing that really excites me is seeing a uh, genre be flipped on its head by new voices coming, coming into the cinematic world. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen The Atlantics, but The Atlantics by director Matty Diop was a really exciting version of a ghost story from a very fem female perspective. And, and that really excites me, seeing, seeing the old tenets of genre get turned on its head. Um, I think Get Out did this just so remarkably, um, using genre as a way to um, kind of take the spear and send it back in a different direction, you know, to kind of penetrate um, the culture is really, to me, fascinating. Allison, Allison Minto, where are you? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, Allison. Hi, hi. Um, it's like a, a two-part question. One, um, uh, there's a photo behind you. Um, it's like a black and white. I was wondering if you can talk about that. I'm, I'm curious who they are and let me show it to you. Um, this actually is an interesting story. I haven't gotten out of my pajama pants, guys. <laughs> um, so I don't know how well you can see this if I hold this up, but there was an artist um, in Berlin who, who made this based on uh, watching part two of the OA. And in part two of the OA, there were um, these plant like tendrils that came out of the ear and became these flowers and it was connected to this whole mythology about um interdimensional travel through this sort of this um planet plant like map and this artist takes photographs and does embroidery on top of them and so he had created this like um really beautiful embroidery coming out of the ears of a found photograph and i was so touched by it i found his work online um, and I, I, and he sent me this. And, and that's been one of the beautiful things about, about um, making the OA is just the volume of incredible artwork that has come our way from people watching the show. And, you know, I've seen so many interesting riffs on octopuses, telepathic communication with octopus, you know, uh, the movements, I mean, just dazzling artwork. It's, yeah. So that, that was very moving to me and I keep that nearby to remind me of why it's worthwhile to make art because we really, I think, do kind of um, enter into a kind of collective dream together. And it isn't really about uh, uh, less to do with who, you know, puts the initial seed out there and more to do, I think, with what pollinates. It's interesting you say that because um, I was going to ask you, too, as my last question, like, is there an artist out there that you think that we haven't heard of or that you want to give a shout out to here on this platform? Yes, you, you all have probably heard of her, um, but I am really interested in a couple female painters recently. Um, Hilma Alf Klint, who had a big retrospective recently, um, who was doing abstract expressionist work like very early on. Um, and was kind of uncredited for that at the time and even, you know, after. Um, also, Leonora Carrington is a painter who does this incredible surrealist work. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm finding myself very drawn to painters lately. Um, 
I don't know why, but they, they seem, there's a surrealism that, and a sort of abstract expressionism that feels mystical in that, in that space that I don't quite yet know how to articulate in cinematic language, but I am seeing it a lot in, paint, in painting and that's inspiring. Tara, are you there, Tara? So I think this is gonna be our last question. Has she been, Sir Otter? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Uh, my question was uh, about like the paradox of all these elements that you have in the show, the supernatural elements of mysticism, science, current culture and I wanted to like sort of ask more about your relationship with the two and how or with all of them and how you sort of balance it all for yourself in a way that like uh speaks to this like realism in the world that is really abstracted it's a very broad question but... oh, it's a great question it's a fantastic <laughs> question um yeah I mean I think I think a lot about I think a lot about like um, science as a kind of like specific probe or specific language with rules. And it is an attempt to dissect and get at the nature of things, like how things are, why things are. And it, it deals a lot with measurement, you know. Um, and then there is this other world that I guess you could call the sort of mystical world, which is, it sort of defies measurement in a way. Um, and I guess, but I think that those worlds ultimately meet at the same place. You know, I think science is trying to articulate these more abstract things, but it, it's sometimes using, at least at this point, kind of blunter tools. And then, you know, poetry and photography and art and dance and movement, they're also after the same thing. I mean, speaking of the body keeps the score, I think, you know, dancers and people in the theater who were doing things through movement, I think they came to a sense um, of what those disciplines were capable of uh, in terms of processing and relieving trauma long before the MRI scan could reveal the amygdala in the brain and say, okay, this is what's happening to the amygdala during trauma and this is how it responds and this is how the patterns of the brain light up, you know, during the rapid eye movement therapy and this is what can be re relieved, you know, it, they're, they're wanting to get to the same place, but they're using a completely different set of tools and morality and like ideas to get there. And that, that discord, that contrast, that paradox, as you said, is um, really fascinating to me. Like I, I, I you know, I, there's a great book called um, Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, a woman who was a scientist who I think she got her degree in botany or biology, um, who is also um, of Native American origin. I'm probably gonna massacre the name, but the Potawatomi tribe. And she talks a lot about the things that she can access through her sense of wonder as a scientist, through the language of botany, and, and then the things that she can only access through uh, the language of her people, which she has been teaching herself, verbs that don't exist in English that can get to certain expressions of plants or trees. And yeah, I, I love the idea of that, these dual languages and their, their different approaches to try to get at the same thing, which is really, I think, just wonderment and awe at all that we cannot explain. <laughs> Well, Britt, thank you so much. This has been so extraordinary and you're so generous to give us this time. And I'm so grateful to you, Gregory, and to all of you for joining us and to your, for your beautiful questions. I mean, this was such a lovely thing to arrange during this time that we're all quarantined in our rooms and um, just very, very moving to me. So thank you. Well, why don't we all just um, thank our wonderful guests. Oh, thank you all. Thank you guys.